Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Zenobia Harris, and I am the CEO for the Kent Chamber of Commerce. On behalf of my staff and the board of directors, we'd like to welcome you to our August luncheon business town hall. Today, our event is sponsored by Around the Clock. It's time to relax and let them take care of the details of your residential property management needs. Around the Clock has been serving King and North Pierce County with Community Association Management, single family, small multiplex rental leasing and management, as well as listing and selling real estate investment properties since June of 1990. From the beginning, the company was, was based on the belief that who better to run the company than those who work in it. As a result, after a period of time, personnel are awarded company stock and qualify to serve on its board of directors. For that reason, Around the Clock has a diverse dynamic team of long-term professionals who are loyal, knowledgeable, and committed to maintaining best practices for its clients and gives the company stability. In 2001, Around the Clock earned the Certified Residential Management Company designation from the National Association of Residential Property Managers. Around the Clock and its managers are active members of the community of Community Association Institute as well as members of the National Association of Residential Association Managers, the Better Business Bureau, and the Northwest Multiple Listing Service. Locally, around the clock are members of the Kent Chamber of Commerce, the Kent Downtown Partnership, Kent Rotary, and also donate annually to the Kent Food Bank. They love the opportunity to discuss their services with you and follow up on your referrals. For more information, you can check them out at www.aroundtheclockinc.com. Thank you again to Around the Clock for your sponsorship. Uh, in addition to our sponsors, we'd also uh, like to thank our investors. And we'd also like to thank our media sponsor, South King Media, also known as I Love Kent. They uh, provide updates and stories and breaking news on local community. So again, they are live streaming this event on Facebook. So thank you so much to them. Now, I'd like to turn it over to our moderator extraordinaire, Carmen Goers, who will introduce our speakers and conduct the remainder of our luncheon. Carmen? Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to everyone. So I am Carmen Goers, Vice President at Heritage Bank Commercial Lending, based out of the Kent branch. I am also the Kent Chamber Governor Affairs Co-Chair, here to moderate the panel today. And so who we have is Derek Matheson, Chief Administrative Officer for the City of Kent, Derek joined the city in 2014 and oversees the day-to-day -day operations of the city. He serves as the mayor's direct report in overseeing 10 department managers and acts as the mayor's liaison to the Kent City Council. Uh, mayor Dana Ralph, uh, elected in 2017, so long ago, right? Um, she was initially elected to the city council in 2011, if I'm correct. She is currently president of the Sound Cities Association representing 38 cities outside of Seattle, chair of the Valley Communications Board, I believe that's our 911 operations, and a member to several Puget Sound regional boards and commissions. Um, and uh, when she's uh, not being mayor, she is a friend to many of us in the community. And thank you for all that you do, Mayor Ralph. Uh, Representative Pat Sullivan was elected in 2004 to represent the 47th district. He is currently the majority leader of the house and serves on the House Appropriations Committee, correct? Did I miss any appointments for you? No, and there's other stuff, but, but that, that's yep. the key stuff. The, <laughs> the part we care about here is your 47th district. Okay. Um, each panelist will have 15 minutes for opening comments, followed by a Q&A session. We've received several questions already. However, if you have questions, please utilize the chat bar below, and as time permits, we will work to go through the questions submitted. Uh, we'll begin with Mayor Ralph, followed by CAO Derek Matheson, and then concluding with Representative Sullivan. So welcome, Mayor Ralph. The floor is yours. Good afternoon. Thank you so much. I want to say thank you, Carmen, for uh, moderating this afternoon, and thank you to the Kent Chamber for providing an opportunity for conversation. Um, in these times where we're all socially distanced, it's just important to be able to see each other and have conversations around um, things that are sort of top of mind. And so Derek and I actually 
um, sort of split this conversation today in I'm going to discuss um, some of the things that we're doing here at the City of Kent around the um, the conversation around race and equity. I know that that's something that's at top of mind for a lot of people right now. And Derek is going to address some uh, COVID and some of the budget issues that, that go along with that. So hopefully between the two of us, we'll, we'll cover the, um, the biggest topics of the day. So I just wanna start um, a little bit talking about things that, that the city as a whole are doing around race and equity. Um, that's a fire truck. I'm sure you guys can all hear there in the background. <laughs> Um, the things that the city is doing um, and then some details on also what's happening in the police department. Um, I know we get a lot of questions about that. So I, I want to talk about our approach to this conversation of race and equity. It's something that's been important to the city of Kent for a very long time. We are a minority majority city um, and we know that our goal is to serve all of our residents um, and also to serve all of our employees and make sure that we are um, aware that we're culturally competent and learning and doing the right thing um, around this conversation all the time. It needs to be a part of our culture. So we have taken some time to put together a plan for steps in going forward, building on the foundations that we already have here at the city. And I just want to highlight some of those um, some of those topics. We started out with some training. Um, we worked with Erin Jones. Many of you know her. Um, she's a, a very well-known um, trainer and speaker when it comes to the conversation of race and equity um, in not only the state of Washington, but across the country. We started out working with her and our leadership team last week. Um, we had multiple hours of conversation with her and um, just to sort of lay a foundation on conversations around systemic racism, how um, decisions that were made many years ago continue to impact our communities and, and helping us get a, a better understanding of the, the complicated nature of questions around race and equity. Um, I will tell you, I learned, I learned a ton. I was really pleased with how our leadership team opened up, asked difficult questions, made themselves um, vulnerable in the conversation so that we could better understand each other's experiences and then use that as we help guide the city. So a similar training is going to be um, happening with all of our managers and supervisors. And then once that occurs, it'll be um, deployed out to all the rest of our employees. Um, excited to see how that conversation evolves. Um, we also are going to be creating a procurement, um, a team that focuses on our procurement process. We wanna make sure here with our buying power at the city that we're really focused on um, buying local, making sure that our contracting system is accessible, accessible to our small businesses, especially our, our um, businesses that are owned by our um, residents of color so that we know that we're not building artificial barriers into that process. Part of it is work that we can do here at the city to make sure that it's a priority and that we use that, that equity lens in everything that we do. And then part of it will honestly be work um, at the state level because there's a lot of rules that, that are required when we, when we procure um, services and contracts around um, bidding and that kind of process. So we're gonna have a, a team, we're in the process of building that charter now that will be looking into that and figuring out how we can um, make sure that we are, that we're focusing our purchasing power in the communities where it's, where it's most needed. Um, another initiative that we're undertaking is all of our department directors are, um, have been tasked with studying, you know, Kent is the 10th most diverse city in America. So we want to know what are the other nine cities doing around race and equity, wanting to know what sort of um, tools they're using to make sure that they're reaching out to all of the members of their community. And we'll be having a report back on um, in each department. So economic developments, looking at their counterparts and economic development so that we can make sure we're implementing best practices um, from across the country. We have also started work on adding in a formal layer of equity in our budget, in our uh, capital budget prioritization. So making sure that that's something that we're looking at as we spend our money. Um, you know, what, what areas of the city, um, need the most investment, where, where are we, how are we making sure that it's equitable and how we're spending those capital dollars, um, ongoing process. I've also committed to outside of COVID, um, increasing 
increasing the frequency of community engagement. So I've already been pretty consistently holding coffee and conversation. The chief has his coffee events, trying to find new ways to engage with people during COVID while we're, while we're stuck inside and then going forward, um, building on things like our neighborhood walks program that we started last year. Um, and making sure, again, that we're using an equity lens as we look at, at um, which neighborhoods we're accessing. It's really important to me that it not just be folks that already know how to access their government. We want to be reaching out to help people that don't know or may be afraid of, of government for a variety of reasons, the background that they came from, um, wanting to make sure that we're figuring out how to reach those communities so it's not just the squeaky wheel um, way that things are being done. Um, looking at the rest of my list here, we are also working on some translation of documents. So we've asked all of our department directors to look at things like the top forms that are used for their department and um, we will start the translation process. You know, Google Translate exists out there, but it's not great, especially when it comes to government. And we want to make sure that we are, are providing both the documents um, to our community that they need, whether it be um, our rental housing inspection program or a complaint with the police department, that, that folks can access those documents in the language that they are the most comfortable with and that we can then also translate responses. So um, ongoing work when it comes to that. Want to quickly highlight a couple of things being done specifically in the police department. I know that that is one of the questions that um, was received earlier about um, what we're doing in the, in the arena of police reform. So um, there's been some criticism out there that somehow the city is ignoring the requests of, of people for police reform or just, just sort of resting on the work that we've already done. And, and I wanna say that um, the first part of that's absolutely not true, but we are proud of the work that we've already done in the police department. One of the things that was implemented um, shortly after I became mayor, one of the promises I made to our community was body cameras. Kent is one of the only cities, um, you know, one of a limited number of cities across the state to have body cameras. And the, really the goal of that was transparency in our police department so that everybody has a view of what's happening in those, in those difficult situations. Um, going forward, the chief talked a little bit at our council meeting on Tuesday about some of the things that he is um, in the process of implementing. One of the things we've done is suspended the use of the um, VNR, the vascular neck restraint. Um, sometimes it's referred to as a chokehold. They're, they're actually separate techniques, but we've stopped that. We heard from the community that that was something that they were very concerned about. And we know that there's gonna be federal guidance coming out around that. So that is a, a, an immediate policy change. The chief is also, um, we're in the second or third draft right now of two new standalone policies regarding de-escalation in a situation, as well as duty to intervene. That's um, part of the things we've heard out of the eight can't wait um, requests from the community that we have those policies. So they're in draft form. He will actually be bringing those policies to our um, diversity task force this evening, having a conversation about that, and then working ongoing with our diversity task force on policy review. So making sure that the policies we have in the police department are meeting the expectation of our community. Um, some really important conversations. On that same line, um, we have received multiple requests for our police policy manual, and it's been a, a technology cham challenge, quite honestly. The platform we use was not easily accessible, required um, individual logins and subscriptions. So we have found a way to change that, and here within the next, um, I believe contracts are gonna be signed this week to make that publicly accessible so you'll be able to um, utilize an online tool to look at our police um, policies. Really excited about that work. Um, last thing I want to highlight is um, the chief has assigned one of his commanders, so um, an upper level officer in our department, part of the leadership team, to be our race and social justice coordinator and take a look at how um, the department makes sure that they are using a lens an equity lens in the work that they're doing. And I'm excited to tell you it's Commander Bobby Hollis. Bobby has been um, with our police department, I wanna say somewhere in the area of close to 10 years. Um, you've all probably met him. He's out and about and very much engaged in our community and we're excited to have him doing that work. So I'm gonna put a pause there and um, turn it back over to Carmen. 
Thank you, Mayor. Um, quick little plug follow up. You mentioned uh, some commissions that were reviewing the diversity lens equity. Um, as citizens may want to engage more, can you tell them how to engage as far as boards and commissions and appointments um, that you can have for citizen engagement? Absolutely. So we've got multiple opportunities at the city when it comes to that. We've got um, our diversity task force is a task force set up. Um, the chief is that runs that and we are actually working to formalize that charter. So we've got some good ways for people to engage on that. So stay tuned on that more formal process. Up to this point, it's really been an ad hoc committee of folks that have expressed interest. So if you do have interest in that, I strongly suggest you reach out to the chief um, at this point and then we'll be formalizing that process going forward. We also have our cultural communities board, which is an 18 member board that's been established since Oh, maybe 2017. Um, and anytime we have openings on on that board, we do advertise that on our website, social media. Um, and again, I ask folks that are interested in, in doing that work alongside the city to just reach out to me and, and we can have a conversation and find ways to um, help folks plug in. And a shameless plug for Kent 101. Do we have the next? Oh. Up. Yes. Oh, I saw. Ha it's been so long ago, Carmen. It feels like it was <laughs> six years ago. Um, Kent 101 is a fabulous, I'm going to say fabulous because I thought it went really, really well, um, program that we kicked off here just, just before COVID. Um, and it's a way for people to learn about the work that we do here at the city. It was, um, remind me, Carmen, six weeks long? Six weeks long. Six weeks long. Um, and we, we spend you know, three hours with folks every week over that six week period, talking about what each one of our departments does, the work that's done, some of the rules and guidelines that we have, and just really providing our residents with a format to ask questions about the things that you've always wondered about. Um, we had a great inaugural class um, of really engaged community members. And it's just, it's another tool that we have implemented recently to provide that transparency into what your government's doing, how we're spending your money, what the processes are. Um, I, I, one of my primary goals since becoming mayor is figuring out how do we connect with our community and provide them with, not only provide them with the information that they need, but have a, a two-way dialogue, right? It's all about all of us showing up at the table and having those conversations. I can make assumptions all day long about what the community wants to see and unless I actually hear from folks what they want and what they need, um, then they're just assumptions on my part. And so I, I, um, I learned a ton through the Kent 101 process from our community and the questions that they had. And one of our graduates um, here maybe can, can um, let us know if she learned as much as I had hoped people would. Well, in the effort of time, <laughs> it was a great class. It was a fabulous uh, session. Everybody was uh, well spoken and we learned a lot and they took questions from all over. Um, there was East Hill and West Hill represented, business owners were there. Um, it, it, was, it was a great um, ability to learn different things and why, why some things are just the way they are and how to advocate if you have something different. So yeah. thank, thank you, Mayor. Um, I just saw an opportunity for that. I love it, thank you. To be expressed. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so next we have our CAO, Derek Matheson. You're on mute. All right, you thank go. you, Carmen, and good morning, everybody. Um, so as Mayor Ralph said, I'm going to talk a bit about COVID-19 and how it's impacted the city budget, the services we provide, and then what we're doing to help the business community. So. Um, I'll take you back to the first Monday in March. That's really when COVID-19 landed in Kent. That was the day that we learned the county um, was going to purchase the Kent Econo Lodge um, for an isolation and quarantine facility. And for the first few weeks of COVID-19, um, we were really focused on that facility. But it was a couple of weeks in when um, things started to shut down and we started to realize, oh my goodness, this is going to have a big impact on the city budget. So um, our finance director just started looking at our revenue sources, going source by source, month by month, and came up with some projections. And uh, back on April 14th, 
Um, we briefed our city council that we were facing a shortfall of $15.7 million. Um, that was a, a, a uh, cash burn rate of about a million dollars per month to put things into perspective. Um, we had forecasted that our sales tax um, each month of 2020 would drop between five and 15 percent. And then uh, we forecasted our B&O tax would also drop on a month-by-month -month basis between 15 and 45 percent. And then, of course, there would be significant hits to things like permits um, and to recreation programs, which we're not able to provide and still aren't able to provide. Um, that same week, and Representative Sullivan knows this story well because he's been a big advocate for the city of Kent in this regard, um, we learned that the governor vetoed our streamlined sales tax mitigation. That was a revenue stream of $3.5 million per year that had been in place for about 12 years to make up for a change in the way the state distributed sales tax to cities that negatively impacted Kent and other cities with um, large warehousing communities. So as soon as we briefed the city council on our situation, we gave direction to our departments to identify possible cuts at the 5%, 10, 15, and 20% levels. And that just shows the kind of uncertainty that we were facing back in April. We did not know how bad it was going to get. Um, in addition to reviewing their operating budgets, we asked them to look at their capital budgets. So things like um, street projects, parks projects, technology projects, and figure out um, what still needed to move forward, but what could be deferred if we had to defer it um, as our revenues drop. So um, directors worked hard with their staffs and they turned in options um, to finance in late April. And we had a couple meetings of our leadership team um, where the directors presented the options and we talked them through as a group. And then the mayor, finance director, and I had, I don't know how many meetings, there were several of them where we went through line by line to um, figure out how to align our, um, our expenditures with a lower revenues than we had forecast. So we came up with a plan that we shared with our city council um, on May 18th. And I, I'll preface this by saying um, in the Great Recession about 10 years before, things were really bad for the city of Kent financially. Um, our general fund reserves had dropped to 15 one hundredths of 1% 1 of our budgeted expenditures. But thanks to um, some good policy direction by the mayor and city council and then good discipline by our departments, we had rebuilt our reserves to almost 30% of our general fund expenditures. So the whole idea was save, to save for a rainy day. And as we said a lot um, at that time, um, it wasn't only raining, it was pouring. So we dealt with the $15.7 million shortfall by using $5 million of that rainy day fund. Um, we reduced transfers um, to capital projects by a little over 3 million. Um, we repaid a contribution that uh, the general city budget had made to our employee health and wellness fund. Um, and just uh, in short there, we're self-insured for our employees' medical care. And so we had set aside money in a separate fund and it had a larger balance than it needed. Um, and then we uh, made cuts to our departments, um, ongoing cuts of um, $5 million. And then we made some one-time cuts, so 2020 only of one and a half million dollars. Uh, part of those cuts impacted our staff. We um, ended up eliminating seven, seven vacant positions. Um, we eliminated two more positions and under our union contracts, those employees bumped into um, other positions in the organization. 
um, we actually laid off or retired 11, and then we froze seven positions, um, and those are in the police department, five police officers, two corrections officers. And so unlike the positions that are eliminated that disappear from the budget, these seven positions remain in the budget but won't be filled for the foreseeable future. Um, and then on top of all of that, we ended up furloughing 23 people in our recreation division. And yes, part of that was to save money, but the other part of that was we just can't provide recreation programming, and so it was hard to justify um, having those folks on the payroll. Um, and with the spike in cases and um, you know, continuing in phase two for the foreseeable future, um, we're going to have to decide what we do there um, in the coming weeks as far as when to bring them back. Um, so in addition to those personnel changes, um, we also reduced um, discretionary spending on things like travel, training, and miscellaneous operating expenses. Um, I think the good thing is, is because we didn't end up having to make those cuts at the 20% level, we didn't have to impact our services in a wholesale way. So that means rather than eliminating any functions, um, we cut back across many um, of our functions. So um, what that means is that we were able to sustain our level of services to our business community. Um, so for example, um, our economic development team remains intact. Um, our permit center, we were actually one of the last um, permitting functions to shut down uh, back in March. And through some heroic work by our staff, we were able to move that online in a hurry. Um, and yes, there's been a drop in permit revenue um, and permit activity, but not as much as you would think. And so we're happy we're continuing to provide that level of support. Um, our economic development team has surveyed our business community, um, makes direct contact with businesses, um, and then the, uh, the biggest thing that we've done is our small business grant program. So there was a question about the CARES grant, and so I'm going to kind of weave this together. So the CARES grant was a federal grant that uh, the federal government made to the states, and then our state distributed some of it to cities. And so Kent, based on population, gets about $3.9 million dollars. We've taken one and a half million dollars of that and put it into a small business grant program. And originally it was going to be one million, but we decided that um, we wanted to make a bigger investment, so we increased that. Um, in addition to the grant program, we've also used some funds to buy laptops to become an entirely mobile for workforce, not just for the rest of COVID-19, um, but also for um, future um, emergency incidents where we might have to take our workforce online. And then we're using the remainder of the money um, to reimburse our expenses, things like you know, PPE for city employees. Um, so back to the small business grant, um, $1.5 million. Um, we're making awards of $6,500 per business. Um, in order to remain impartial, and because frankly, we don't have the horsepower to run a big grant program by ourselves on short order, um, we hired an organization called Craft3, and they're managing the intake, evaluation, selection, and dispersal of funds. So um, to be eligible, a business needs to be located in the Kent city limits, um, negatively impacted by COVID-19, um, no more than 15 full-time employees um, in business for at least two years as of June 30th, have annual revenues of $1.5 million or less, and have a current City of Kent business license. And then finally intend to reopen when allowed under the Governor's state Safe Start Plan. So if you haven't applied already, I encourage you to check it out and do that. 
Um, the application is online and the deadline is this Sunday, August 9th at 8 p.m. Um, there are a number of organizations that can help if you have questions. Um, there's the Green River Small Business Development Center, um, the Kent Chamber of Commerce, Kent Downtown Partnership, and of course the City of Kent as well. So definitely check that out. Um, let's see, I guess a couple of silver linings I'll just mention as I wrap up here. Um, you probably heard us say before that the uh, that we have a structural deficit as a city, meaning the cost of providing services grows faster than the revenues every year. Um, we were gonna have to deal with that for 2021 and 2022. And because of COVID and dealing with the revenue shortfalls this year, we were also able to address them for the next two years. And so that makes our upcoming budget process for the next couple of years um, a little bit easier than it would have been because we did some of it early. The other silver lining is that so far our revenue drops have not been quite as bad as we anticipated. And um, if we can stay in phase two and advance in phases in the coming months, um, the steps that we've taken um, will get us through. So that's what I've got for you. Thanks for the chance to tell the story and happy to answer any questions now or later on in the official Q&A segment. So Derek, as you talk about the grant program, the 1.5 million through grant funding, um, does that include our nonprofit or just the for-profit companies? Okay, so I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, that is for um, for-profit small business, and one of the criteria has to do with the level of profit. Um, but um, throughout COVID-19, we made a conscious decision not to cut the um, our human services funding. So that's what we distribute to nonprofits so they can help people who are struggling before COVID and as a result of COVID. So we continue to provide a uh, you know, million dollars in city general funds, a um, million dollars in federal, it's called community development block grant funds. And then we've got close to another million dollars in uh, federal community development block grant funds that are one time only specifically for COVID-19. And we just went through a special application process and our human services commission with the help of a, an expert committee just made some recommendations on how to distribute um, funds to our nonprofit community. So that's happening right now and includes everything from like rent assistance and utility assistance to distribution of PPE. So, um, so our help to nonprofits and those who are struggling is a different pot than the, uh, the CARES money, but still a super important investment for us to make. And a plug for Kent 101, they do tell you about the various pots of money and why they cannot be co-mingled. So very helpful information. <laughs> Thank you, Derek. Thank um, you. And not least, uh, Senator, yeah, Senator, I upgraded you, Representative Sullivan. I, yeah, I don't consider the Senate an upgrade, so that's uh, oh. <laughs> that's good to know. Well, well, thanks to the, the Kent Chamber staff for the work in putting this together. I know having these remote sessions are, it takes a lot of work. So thank you very much. And Carmen, thanks for facilitating the meeting today. Uh, I, don't, I don't plan to speak for 15 minutes. I'd rather answer questions, but just to give you a general overview of what's going on at the state level. Uh, the state uh, adopts a biennial budget, but we're required to balance over four years. Uh, and so when we do our budgeting, it, it can be fairly complex. Uh, we had a revenue forecast in June an official forecast where our state forecaster, our state economist uh, will re renew projections about how our state is doing. Uh, at the June forecast, uh, we know that we are down about uh, $8.5 billion over the four-year period, uh, which we have three years left, just for the current biennium. So the, the biennium ends next July, or June 30th. Uh, we're down about $4.5 billion. Uh, significantly, uh, and it's uh, it's kind of scary. Uh, we have, uh, like the city of Kent, we've been fiscally responsible. We have a rainy day fund uh, that has about $2 billion right now uh, available. 
and we had about a billion dollars in ending fund balance uh, from our last budget. So we have about $3 billion in reserves. That still leaves about a billion and a half dollar hole for uh, the current biennium. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of conversations about session and what, what if we should come in for a special session and when we should come in. Uh, and I think there's a, a, there's, there was a lot of conversations and I, I, a lot of different ideas about how that should happen. I know from, from the House Democratic standpoint, we thought that the best time to come in was before July 1st. There were a number of programs that kicked in July 1st uh, as the new biennium began or the new uh, fiscal year began. Uh, and it seemed to make a lot of sense as far as timing that that would be uh, the ideal time to come in for a special session. But, uh, you know, you have to have an agreement with the governor's office and the Senate, and that just didn't come together. So it's, I would say it's very unlikely that we'll have any special session uh, before, you know, late fall, uh, early winter. Uh, and potentially we may just end up uh, waiting until uh, the next session begins in January. Uh, that being said, there's a great deal of work going on right now. I can tell you this is my 16th interim uh, where, we're, where we're not in session. And I have been far busier this interim than any other uh, interims, I'd, I'd say combined. Uh, we've got a lot of work going on, a lot of teams working in different areas. Uh, I'm involved with our budget team in looking at how we're gonna balance our budget. We're also looking at the CARES Act money that came into the state. Uh, about $2 billion uh, came, $2.1 billion came directly to the state of Washington uh, for disbursement to a, a wide variety of, they have to be coronavirus related uh, activities. Uh, and so uh, the governor allocates those dollars. If we're not in session to do a budget specifically for the allocation of those dollars, uh, the governor's office does it through the Office of Financial Management. Uh, but we've been working, as a matter of fact, we have a meeting today at one o'clock to go over uh, a set of expenditures for the Department of Health. Uh, directly related to testing. And so, you know, we've uh, been having significant numbers of meetings in how those dollars will go out. I'd say there's about a billion dollars remaining, about a billion dollars has been spent on a wide variety of things from the Department of Health for PPE, for testing, uh, for, for healthcare purposes, uh, money going out to OSPI for uh, education related activities, uh, a lot of money going to commerce, partly for uh, rental assistance, partly for small business assistance. And so there's a, a lot of work going on uh, at the state level. Uh, we, uh, as the House Democratic Caucus, we have caucus meetings. Uh, we had them every week, now we have them every other week. Uh, in addition to the budget group, we've got a group looking at revenue options. Uh, we've got a group looking at police reform. Uh, we have a number of legislators who are uh, working on a racial equity lens. Uh, that can be applied to not only budget decision making but to uh, policy making as well. And so that work will, uh, when we do come into session, uh, enable us to, to act quickly uh, and decisively. Uh, and that's what we're going to need as we move forward. I'm, I, uh, I, I'm not saying I'm excited about next January uh, because it's going to be very difficult decision making uh, during that time frame. I know there's a lot of concern from individuals who are unemployed right now and trying to get uh, money from the department, uh, employment security department, and the delays there have been very frustrating. Uh, and we have been working very hard to try to correct that. Uh, from our individual office, if, if people are having problems accessing employment security, and we're hearing from a lot of them, but please contact uh, our offices and we will do our best to try to assist in getting them through that line. Uh, part, part of the problem was just the sheer volume of uh, applications for unemployment. And part of it was the, the scam that uh, hit Washington especially hard, uh, given the fact that we have a, a fairly robust uh, employment security program here in the state of Washington. And so we were targeted first. Other states were, were hit as well, uh, but we were hit first and, and fairly hard. And we've got that under control now and things are, are, are doing better, uh, but there's still much work to be done in, in, in that area. And uh, hopefully, if there are people who are still uh, struggling to get those benefits, please let us know and, and we'll, we'll do our best to, to, to get that set up. Uh, with that, you know, I think I'll just stop there and rather answer questions that, that people might have. Well, thank you, uh, Representative Sullivan. Um, I, I have one of those young adults who's been waiting, so I did give her your name and number. So 
you'll see that coming through shortly, I'm sure. No, yeah, <laughs> it's been three months. Yeah. So thank you. Um, actually, you, you, between the three of you, you answered the majority of questions that we had coming through. Um, Representative Sullivan, one thing that I um, has have heard of, there are concerns that the unemployment insurance trust fund um, is at the current level depletion may run below a certain threshold that will automatically begin increased taxes on business. Can you speak to that concern? Sure. Actually, a number of states uh, who I, we, we've got it. We had passed a, a law a number of years ago that uh, would, would try to level up because what was happening is we were giving rebates to businesses. Uh, then when the when the trust fund uh, had a lot of expenditures, it would be underwater. And so we, we passed a law that would try to balance that out over a period of time so you don't have these big fluxes. Uh, unfortunately, though, no system could predict or deal with the sheer volume of requests that were made uh, over the last several months. And so uh, we expect that uh, the, the Department of Employee, the Trust Fund will probably have to take out a loan uh, toward the end of the year to ensure that we can continue to provide the benefits. And so that there will likely be a, uh, a future cost to, to business in order to replenish that fund, that the rates are automatically set depending upon uh, the, the, how much money is in the trust fund. When we come into session, one of the things that we're going to be talking about is trying to uh, phase that in in a way that makes it easier for the business community. You know, we don't want to have a direct hit immediately uh, on, on the businesses that are already struggling. Uh, that just doesn't make any sense. And so we want to work with you. We want to work with the Association of Washington Business uh, at the state level to try to figure out a way to, to make it as painless as possible. But uh, again, from, from Washington's perspective, there were there are states that have already actually delved into to those loans and are in far worse shape than the state of Washington. Uh, the prep work that we did made it uh, much better for our, the business community here in the state of Washington. And, and following up on that, you were in session during the um, recession back in 2007. Are there similarities to our options going forward in this next session that you saw that you can forward to that? Is it completely different? Uh, what are the tools that we have, um, tools and resources available to the city and the state as we, as we move forward? Sure, and <clears throat> there are a number of differences. There are some similarities. I mean, just the sheer magnitude of the problem uh, from the Great Recession and today, it's, it's pretty similar, uh, but there was a huge drop off. During the Great Recession, it was over a period of time. I mean, he, here during this uh, you know, pandemic, we just saw the economy just you know, fall out immediately. And so it, you know, the, the need is, is far greater, quicker uh, during this pandemic than what it was during the Great Recession. You know, I would also say, given the fact that we were a little better prepared with the, uh, you know, having a rainy day fund and ending fund balance, that will help offset some of that cost. And I will say that, and I'm sure that our Kent City officials would say the same thing. We are looking very eagerly at Congress right now. Uh, I know that I heard yesterday they were hoping to get an agreement on a, on a, a another disbursement. Uh, by, by they'd hope to get a deal by Friday and, and vote on it next week. And I'm still hoping that they they will do that, and that in that package will be some assistance uh, for state and local governments. I know that the, the House passed proposal did provide a significant amount of relief for uh, uh, both cities and the state. And so we'll see what happens there. Uh, without that assistance, it means that again, it would be about a billion and a half dollar shortfall in the current biennium, uh, which we can handle through a variety of options. Obviously reducing spending is one of those. Uh, and we're looking at a number of revenue options as well. Uh, we obviously don't want to impact people who are already struggling or, or the business, small business community that's really struggling. So, you know, they, you got to walk a fine line there. Uh, and that's why we're doing a lot of outreach right now and trying to figure out the best solutions so that when we come into session, we can do it fairly, fairly quickly. But there are similarities, but there are a lot of differences as well. And so, you know, should we be called back to special session? I say we, because collectively we go with you. Um, it talks about social distancing within the Capitol and how you'll do your work. Um, I've been to your office and we've, we've put 15, 20 people in your office. Um, so are there thoughts about how we can engage with our legislatures as session returns? Yeah, and so, you know, part, part of our, our challenge is not just on the, you know, on the side of, you know, uh, 
having the solutions and having the bills ready to pass. Uh, part of it is on technically how we come together as a legislature. Uh, right now, uh, you know, Thurston County is not in a in a phase which would allow us all to come together uh, in a session. We'd have to do it remotely or at least through some hybrid model. And so we've been working on a number of models. Our legislative uh, technology group uh, has put together a platform that would allow us to have a remote session or have a hybrid session. Would also allow, uh, public, we're, we're, we're just getting into the phase right now of testing our uh, ability to have public testimony at committee hearings. Uh, in September, we have, uh, each committee will have an opportunity to have a have a work session uh, and a hearing and some will allow for public testimony, uh, hopefully that, you know, if our, if our testing works very well, uh, but we think what that will get there, you know, there's no way that we can actually go into a decision making mode without the ability for the public uh, and organizations to be able to testify and provide input on any proposals that, that we put together. Uh, that's a critical part of our democracy and we're not going to operate in a, in a, vacuum and make decisions without that kind of input. We look forward to hearing how that's going to work itself forward. Um, some other questions regarding our city are um, contraction in, in some salaries and uh, are there any affordable housing opportunities coming to the city as we see development still going forward? I can address um, address that a little bit. So um, one of the projects that we do have in the pipeline, um, not, not necessarily in the affordable housing realm, but in um, permanent supportive housing is a project that Catholic Community Services is building up on our West Hill. And it's somewhere in the range of 80-ish 80, 80 units um, that will be permanent supportive housing for, um, for folks that are, that are experiencing homeless homelessness and one of the things I'm really proud of is we were able to work with CCS and there are about 10 of those units that will be set aside for um, for folks that we know are homeless in Kent. So we'll be able to provide that um, that supportive housing for them um, right out of right out of the gate as part of that when that project opens. Um, on affordable housing, it's a little bit of a tricky conversation because it depends on what your definition is um, and it varies all over the board. Um, I can tell you that in our housing stock analysis, and this is a point of disagreement based on definitions, Kent has a significant stock of um, what is considered affordable housing, um, more so than most other areas in our county. Um, and one of our primary focuses um, is and will continue to be to make sure that we maintain that stock and that we maintain it at a, a level that um, people deserve. So that's part of why we put our rental housing inspection program in place was to make sure that the units, uh, the affordable units that exist in the city of Kent stay high quality. Does that include our moderate income residents that there'll be um, housing that supports we, we haven't had new concepts example, that are sometimes your entry level. Are those projects coming along as well? So um, the, the, the newest projects we had two, Derek, help me here, four or five years ago, we, um, the um, Riverview project up on the West Hill was put in place and that's all affordable um, housing with, with income cap requirements. So that project is not, um, not that old. Um, the two the two newest projects we have are on the higher end of the rental scale, um, but what we know about that is it helps housing stock at all areas of the spectrum help all other areas. So it, it prevents what we call compression. So if you can afford a higher rent apartment, but that's not available in the city of Kent, you're taking up space in an apartment that might be, or multifamily development that might be needed for somebody that their income better fits that. So by expanding our stock, making sure we have things available in the, the low, low income, all the way up through the high income, it actually helps equalize and make um, that middle income stock more available to our residents. Okay, so I'm going to move to some transportation questions, which uh, I feel like I've been talking about for 10 years. Um, so within the city, uh, uh, we have bike paths, bike trails, public transit um, has been changed in COVID. Do you see um, people maybe less apt to be on public transportation for various security reasons? Do you see an increase in bike paths, bike trails, 
Um, do we become like Seattle uh, with, with that? Any thoughts or concerns? Sure, I can um, take a take a stab at that. So, and having a lot of conversations with both Metro Transit and um, Sound Transit as well, King County Metro, the bus provider, uh, we have seen a decrease in ridership, but less in Kent um, and the South End than we have in other places. And and part of that is, is that we know that our residents um, may or are very well more transit dependent. That's their only form of transportation. So we are working with King County Metro to make sure as they, as they look at, at cuts in the, in the county that we're really talking about where the biggest need is. And I, I do feel like Kent's gonna fare fairly well when it comes to um, those transit routes because there is an understanding, especially on the part of Metro, that our residents really rely on transit. It's going to take a long time before ridership gets back to to pre-COVID levels. And we also know that their workforce is going to change, right? If you can work from home, the, there's a pretty strong likelihood that at least on some days, people will continue to work from home. The idea of, of at least in, in the near future, people going back into the office five days a week, if they're not already doing it, probably not going to happen. Um, we have been, as a city, very much committed to um, multimodal transportation, and we are in the process of going through our transportation master plan right now. Council just um, received a briefing on that, and it does include multiple projects that are multimodal, so bike paths, um, improving sidewalk connections, and making sure that people have options outside of just that single, single vehicle um, trip, so definitely something we're focused on. I don't see us closing down major roads permanently. That's not how that's not how our Kent, Kent residents live. It's very different in, than in Seattle, um, but definitely continuing to focus on multimodal transportation here in the city. Thank you. Um, in regards to South Transit, uh, they still have not determined the location of the uh, maintenance facility, oh, the OFM, I believe it's called. Is that right? O M operation and maintenance facility. O -M <laughs> yes, O M F. Um, and so the the uh, the there's still a Kent option on the table. Have you had any updates to that uh, progress? Uh, so it's still going through the environmental review process, um, and Kent is still an option. A hundred percent speculation. Um, they're they're seeming to become more interested in that location than maybe previously. You know, initially. Um, the, it was it's too expensive, not possible, not able to do it for, for a variety of engineering reasons. Um, they're still engaged in the facility. So um, Derek, unless you've got anything to add to that, I, I think it's still, a, it's still a top contender. Yeah, no, I, that's exactly right. And just to clarify, I think everybody knows this, but they were looking at a few sites at Kent. The Lowe's and Dick site is off the table. What they're looking at now is the Midway landfill, which the city pointed out very early on would be an ideal place. And early on, they kind of dismissed the cost of building on it. But as the mayor said there, as they look into it, they're starting to find what we found that that might be a good location for that kind of use. Representative Sullivan, you have been very supportive and helped with the transportation package that was passed a few years ago, um, supporting the South Sound projects. Um, what do we need to do to continue to, um, are those on the chopping block in this next session? Will, they, will those still projects still go through to help improve our mobility down here in the South End? Yeah, and so we're, we're, there, there is a shortfall right now. Uh, the initiative that passed last year for the state wide uh, transportation budget, about a half a, half a billion dollars was uh, lost. Uh, then because of COVID related uh, impacts, it's about another half a, uh, half a billion dollars in, in revenue uh, for transportation. So our transportation chair is looking at a variety of options. One of the things that we're talking about is having another transportation package that would obviously help uh, local governments like Kent, but would also fill the hole for the, the lost revenue and the, the, the next list of projects. During an during a economic downturn, one of the best things that the state can do is invest money, create jobs in communities across the state. And you do that by uh, infrastructure projects. So the capital budget and transportation budget is a way to ensure that you're, you're spreading that around the state. So you're getting the benefit of having uh, infrastructure improvements uh, and creating those jobs. 
And so I, I think probably the, the, it'll be a challenge to get all that together. Uh, we've also got an issue, and I, I know that Dana and, and Derek have probably have talked about this uh, a lot, is culverts. You know, we were sued over uh, at the state level over our, our lack of culverts. And so local governments also have that responsibility. And so as part of that transportation package, uh, that has to be included uh, as, as, a, as a, uh, a pot of money uh, to resolve that issue as well. So, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can get uh, both a robust capital budget and transportation budget adopted when we get into session next January. And so speaking of some other funding, um, budgetary funding, I know you've worked really diligently on um, fully funding education in the last few years, of se last few sessions. Um, with the change in our workforce potentially, um, what are the plans to protect student access to community and technical education in the Workforce Education Investment Act? Um, yeah, that work Workforce Student Investment Act that we passed two years ago was, was just such a, a big deal. I mean, it really, not only did it create a fund that will uh, hopefully sustain funding for higher ed, uh, but it increased access for students who are low income. Uh, and so, uh, we need to protect the, that funding. I haven't been able to see uh, a, a forecast for that specific fund and you know how, how far they're down. I don't think they'll be as far down as our general fund is. And so that, that's, that's better uh, than the general fund is, is doing. We also have made a commitment for this coming school year that students who uh, are getting the state need grant will get the state need grant. We won't pull that money back. Uh, the question is what we do in the, the next biennial budget uh, and how we deal with uh, funding for specifically for state need grants. And so that'll be a, a, a broader part of our, of our budget uh, conversation. You know, just, just a quick overview on, the, on, on how the budget works. About 70% of the budget is uh, protected. It's either basic education, uh, it's funding that uh, is uh, required by the, by the federal government for maintenance of effort or for uh, match. Uh, or it's required by contract, like uh, debt service or, or pension contributions. And so you only have about 30% of the budget that's available to even look at reductions. And in that area, it includes uh, services for developmental disabilities, for long-term care, for higher education, for corrections. So it's, it's really difficult to, to get in there. And you know, higher ed, uh, typically when we've had recessions, has really bared a more than their share of uh, impacts from reductions. Um, but this session, part of the difference is that we have a law now that won't allow tuition increases uh, that we saw during the very recession in double digits. Uh, you can only increase tuition uh, at uh, uh, the, the rise in uh, uh, earnings of individuals. So uh, that's not a solution that's available to us in this next biennium. And, I think higher ed will fare better than it has uh, during the last go around during the Great Recession. Thank, thank you. Um, my last uh, question I have here, uh, going back to the city, and uh, I want to say it was two years ago, we had put a proposal that we have, we have known that we have um, an understaffed police force, and we had initially put out a request uh, for tax to tax ourselves to improve our increase our, our police department. Um, it was our understanding that we were going to step this November. That was a pre COVID conversation, of course. Um, where does that stand? What are your thoughts on how policing will change and be realigned? Um, really good question, complicated answer. Um, I can tell you the short answer, yes, we had intended on going back out to the voters for an additional 30 police officers, but also some of the things that our community is currently asking for. So we wanted um, to be able to fund some co-responders with the police department. So mental health providers, crisis responders, those kinds of things. Um, opportunities for community engagement. Uh, way back 100 years ago, at my State of the City address, which was really just, I think, the 5th of March, we talked about, about that. Um, obviously, COVID has completely changed that plan just because I cannot go and ask our voters to take on any additional burden. And then the conversation around police reform occurred um, most recently. So there, we are taking a look at how we rethink 
policing in the city of Kent. I will tell you, I 100% believe that our police department is underfunded. So the idea of defunding or taking funding away from them does not um, does not set well in the in our in our need to be able to keep our community safe. Um, I would like to see this conversation be an and instead of an or. Um, we do need programs like co-responders with our police department. There's models of that, um, the CAHOOTS program in Oregon. Um, I know that our chief is working with some of our legislators on how do we set up, um, how do we set up a pilot program where we've got officers that are, um, before they even get to the academy, are spending time in our community learning about um, working with our nonprofits, learning about our residents, really becoming embedded in who we are as a city and understanding our needs long before they actually get in a police car and go out and do that, um, that more traditional policing work. Um, we have, out of necessity, developed things like our um, special operations unit that does outreach to the homeless um, population in Kent. We would love to see funding opportunities to um, help with, with those kinds of things. So we will be um, working with our legislators um, this upcoming session to figure out how do we do that? How do we fund mental health services? All of those things. I really do strongly believe in it that it's an and conversation instead of an or conversation. Thank you. Um, so we're gonna, I have no further questions in the queue um, or that I believe I've overlooked. Um, I'm, I'm glancing through them really quickly. So I always wanna say, you know, thank you for your service. This has been um, a very difficult season as we, most of us can acknowledge. And um, we were in Kent 101 when the hotel was being acquired and um, we had class that day as you were frantically moving um, between interviews and conversations with the with the King County. So thank you for all that you do as well. Um, and Representative Sullivan, I know that you you felt called to come back, come out of retirement <laughs> to to help serve during this time. And so thank you for, for that. Uh, and Derek, you've always been accessible to many of us. As we move forward um, and we have ideas and concepts, what's the best way for us to communicate back to you? What's the best way you like us to be engaged? And how can we help you serve our community better as we work with state and or state, local and or federal officials? Well, so from, from my perspective, you know, it, it's obviously it's harder now. I mean, I, I'm an old fashioned person. I'd, I'd like to meet in person. That's always been my way of, of doing business. And so I'm adapting to this new Zoom world that we exist in. And so uh, my cell phone is available. I, I post my phone number everywhere and anywhere. People can feel free to call me directly. Uh, email obviously works as well. I'm happy to set up Zoom meetings uh, to talk about very specific issues. Uh, and at the state level, you know, we're going to continue to have a conversation with the business community to figure out strategies moving forward. So not just with Kent, but, you know, broadly with the Association of Business and the Business Roundtable. Uh, you know, this has to be a partnership. Our, our solutions can't be partisan. They can't be uh, one-sided. Uh, we got to get through this by working together. And so the more conversations that we can have on solutions uh, to move us forward in a positive direction, you know, they always say that, you know, with crises come great opportunities. And I, I really truly believe in that. And I think we can actually come through this uh, even stronger, but that'll only happen if we can work together on solutions. And here at the city, even though our building is closed, city government is still operational and still interacting with residents. So you can email us, mayor at kentwa.gov. You can call us at 253-856-5700. Um, we may not have a live person answering, but we listen to every message and respond to people. And then of course, social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, we're even on LinkedIn. So those are all ways that you can reach out. And so we're very much engaged with, um, with residents, maybe even more so right now during COVID-19. And I want to add um, additionally that we do have a strong relationship with the Chamber. Zenovi and I speak on a on a fairly regular basis. We had our early morning call um, just yesterday, right? That was only yesterday. 
Um, so if, you know, make sure that you're utilizing those relationships as well. Um, I do try and attend as many board meetings as I can, um, but same thing, accessible by phone, email, um, reach out. Uh, like I said, Sonovia and I are in conversation and, and as well as our economic and community development department. Um, I will second what Pat said. My favorite thing in the world to do is like the coffee and conversation meetings that we have and just sitting down and talking to people. And our world has changed dramatically. Um, there feels like a, a significant disconnect. And so any opportunity we have to have conversations, whether it be a phone call, a Zoom meeting, um, you know, that kind of thing. We're, we're here. We want to hear um, what's going on and how we can be of assistance. So please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you. Uh, we got one last question in to Representative Sullivan. What keeps you up at night when you think about the next legislative session? You know, I think it's, it, it's the cuts that were made during the Great Recession to, to some of the safety net programs that you know, still haven't recovered actually from that time period. Uh, you know, some were built back very slowly, but when you adjust any of those programs for inflation, many of them are still behind where they should have been. Uh, and especially during a time of great need, uh, you know, you mentioned it, there are more people during a recession that go back to our community and technical colleges. So you have a big caseload increase there, uh, more people who access medical care, more people who uh, access programs that you know they wrote that the state has to provide and so trying to balance that without putting additional burdens on businesses that are struggling and individuals who are struggling uh it's just uh, finding that right balance is hard and i would say that's that's what keeps me up at night is the impact it has on on families and businesses Thank you for your comments uh, today, and I'm going to turn this back over. I, I want to also thank Zenovia for creating a space for this conversation and ask her for her closing thoughts for the, for the good of the order. All right, thank you. Um, so, yeah, so I appreciate everyone who was able to make it out today. Um, Pat, we haven't had a chance to, or so we haven't had a chance to really meet and talk in person, and I'm one of those people too. So I'm open to lunch outside in the open air because that is, we can do that uh, for the yes, governor. So we can get that set up sooner than later. I uh, appreciate all of the support from the city. And, uh, you know, like the mayor said, I'm texting sometimes questions I already know the answer to. But as a community member, I want to make sure that I get you the right answer. So again, make sure that that line of communication is open. Um, and we are here for you. The chamber is really here to support all of the businesses in the community. Uh, we also are looking at our mission and vision um, as it relates to um, having an equitable lens. And so that's all businesses, big, small, for-profit or non-profit, right? So uh, we just appreciate that support and we're excited to be able to move in that direction uh, with diversity and inclusion. Um, the, the last thing is I'm gonna share my screen here for just a second. And uh, we do these things now because everything has changed with COVID-19. So um, we have a commercial break by uh, MSC, so just give me one second as I get that going. MSC, Multi-Service Center, is a nonprofit serving low to very low income households throughout South King County with resources such as housing, employment, education, and energy assistance. During the COVID-19 pandemic, they have continued to offer their services, pivoting quickly to provide remote services to an increasing number of individual families, individuals and families, and seniors who face economic, economic insecurity. You can help by joining MSC at its virtual fundraising luncheon. Uh, MSC helps luncheon on October the 15th. And you can also learn more by visiting their website at www.mschelps.org. And so, you know, last but not least, again, thank you so much to Mayor Ralph, Representative Sullivan and Derek for your updates. Uh, we look, to, look forward to more updates as they come up. Also, we wanna thank Around the Clock for their sponsorship today. And we urge you to register for our luncheon next month where we're gonna be talking with officials. Um, we'll be talking with health officials. We'll be talking with folks who work in the mental health uh, industry or realm so that they can understand how businesses are affected by COVID-19 and what strategies are in place or resources are in place to help businesses as they begin to welcome their uh, staff back into their workplace. So. Again, thank you so much for joining us for our August luncheon. Carmen, as always, 
uh, moderator extraordinaire. You definitely have a pulse on what's going on in the community and we appreciate that. So with that being said, enjoy the rest of your day and we are always here to support.